and we've heard a little bit about uh, resonance, informants, and all that to help us do that. So my comments today are from the perspective of a specific genre, but I think the principles are representative of the process of training elite level singers of any style. So we've heard a lot of very interesting summary information in the sessions today on the mechanisms involved in voice production. So we've come so far in our understanding of, of how everything works. It's amazing. All very interesting and helpful to know. My task, however, is to consider other things, the pedagogy of voice. So this will be a summary review, and I acknowledge that many important, even primary elements will be left off the table. 30 minutes isn't a very long time. Our work in this arena focuses on two primary elements, technical skill and artistry. Every lesson that I teach includes a balance of these two things. Ultimately, they are inextricably linked, and one must acquire a good technical approach of the physical voice so that it can do what the artistic self wants to express. And I believe the artistic element is, in the end, the most important. The science behind producing a dramatic work of art is fundamental to the task, but in the end, the observer doesn't really care too much about how the sculpture was produced. There we go. So the technical part of producing this sculpture by Jeff Koons was quite demanding and very expensive, I understand. But the typical observer doesn't really care too much about that. They just say, wow, that's amazing. It's a beautiful piece of sculpture. They marvel at it. Well, the typical audience member at the opera doesn't really care much about the technical aspects of singing, unless they are an aficionado themselves. The uninformed enthusiast often will tolerate vocal and technical faults um, if the singer is a convincing vehicle for the music and the character that they are portraying. Many examples of this could be mentioned. Great artists are not always great technicians, and great technicians are not always great artists. But when the two elements are combined, great artistry and great technique, the result is transcendent.
I think it was worth more than a couple of minutes of my time. Yeah. Nobody did it better than that lady. So I'm going to begin by discussing some of the elements that contribute to the development of an artist. One of my jobs as a voice teacher is to help my students open channels of vulnerability so that the words that they are singing can be expressed sincerely and perceived as novel and genuine. Sometimes all I must do is just give them permission or let them know that I expect it from them. Sometimes it can be quite a difficult journey. Everything that they sing must be motivated. The most rudimentary exercise for building the voice is most effective when motivated from the heart. Every song and every opera role tells a story that must be revealed with honesty. I had a student a few years ago working on Samuel Barber's Knoxville Summer of 1915, an incredible piece of music. I hope you've heard it. The text you may know is by James G., who was from the South and wrote about his experience there. The story was so personal to my student, so reflective of her own life growing up in Louisiana, that it took her three times in my studio class to actually make it through without breaking down into tears. She had to learn to play that margin to use her emotional connection to the text without letting it go too far, without letting it take over. Once established, the balance resulted in a very powerful, evocative performance. The emotional, psychic, spiritual, and intellectual personification of the text must be the goal for a singer. And therefore, we as voice teachers must be prepared to help them get there often by challenging our students to experience their emotions in a way that can be quite overwhelming sometimes. Singers must learn to love poetry, verse, and the written word. As voice teachers, we must be able to guide them into this literary world. Great composers of vocal music were and are poets. Even if they never penned an original phrase, it is the text that motivates them to enhance and support the meaning of the words with their music as they interpret it. I had the privilege of working with the great American composer Jake Hagee a few years ago. He did two residencies at UNT and uh, around the time of the Dallas production of the great opera Moby Dick. Jake is also a fabulous song composer, as you know. When working with our singers on his music and master classes that he did for us, he focused exclusively on the delivery of the text. Having them move around the stage as they recited the words to help them find the release in their mind and their body from constraint. It's very interesting to note that their singing always improved without a word of technical advice. As a culture, we do not read poetry if we once did. Even in our literature courses in high school or college, we do not spend time learning elocution, the art of delivery. This is indispensable for a fine singer to understand. As singing teachers, we must be able to lead our singers to transform words to the effective spoken word and finally to integrate it in with the musical structure that the composer has used to enhance them. It's a, it is a text-driven art, and we must know how to do this in at least four languages, a lot more than that in recent years, right? I can't emphasize enough the importance of maintaining the prosodic elements, that inherent melody of spoken language, in the singing of a phrase. The old adage, come si parla si canta, has no more powerful application than in this context. Being an artist is all this and much, much more. I want to move now to the training of the voice itself. If a young singer wants to be an opera singer, they must sound like one. The teacher provides that guidance as to what will lead to that end. The well-established aesthetic serves as the ultimate goal and should keep our work on track. But we must know how to lead them there without imposing unreal expectations prematurely. I believe that the aesthetic follows optimal function. Teach proper function, and the beauty and the dynamic qualities of the voice will emerge. Not everyone takes this approach. This can lead us, and this can lead to a student to continuous manipulation of their sound to try to please the teacher. There is a well-known equivalent in professional volleyball training called train ugly, where the goal is not to be perfect, but to train free of the goal of the result, while the proper neural pathways are being built through random practice and unprogrammed play, rather than strictly programmed drills. 
For me, I must allow my students or encourage them to make ugly sounds sometimes and to be unpredictable while they are establishing proper function. I always take it as a sign that I am doing my job when one of them cracks a note. They hate it. I love it. It means that they are free enough to break and the beauty will follow. All musical instruments require highly developed motor skills to perform at an elite level. So we can all certainly appreciate the level of skill acquired by that fine player. A violinist with a fine instrument has the advantage that the instrument itself is stable. Skill develops with an excellent instruction and practice around the predictability that the instrument you pull out of the case today is just like it was yesterday, and it will be the same tomorrow. It is not so with a singer. While a singer is learning how to sing or how to play with their voice, they are also learning how to build the instrument. They must learn to create a responsive and dependable voice to play upon. The form of the instrument must be learned and stabilized without really understanding what it could or even should be. Sounds impossible when I think about this. The quality of the voice can vary drastically from day to day. Consider the impact of puberty, normal growth, influence of seasonal URIs, monthly or even daily changing hormones, and of course the learning process itself. A good teacher must understand a developmental timeline. Do not expect too much too soon. But even worse, in my opinion, is to expect too little. I always keep in mind the fact that Olympic gymnasts are often in their middle to late teenage years at their peak performance ability. I have encountered so many college-age students, even graduate students, with years of vocal training who have been taught by well-intentioned but overly cautious teachers. They are now at the age where they should be competitive, but their voices have not been developed to be so. And they are woefully behind, and time is short. It takes time to learn to play the violin. Advancement is made only when certain prerequisite skills have been acquired to support the next level of complexity. It's like learning math. There is no shortcut. Knowledge and skill in basic math must be mastered before trig and algebra. Too often a young singer is thrown into the deep end of the pool and forced to figure it out with little formal musical training and little voice training that isn't passively acquired. The best way to train a voice is with a good teacher who uses a progressive method. This is not as common as one would believe. We take shortcuts. Singers are usually late to the game in their training. And we try to teach them to sing by singing the literature. The standard of careful, progressive, methodical skill acquisition and singing training is the exception, it's the exception and not the rule on the phrase. Great singing involves the entire body. There is an optimal posture that we must teach our singers. This element of pedagogy has been identified as a target for study as long as treatises have been written about voice training. The noble posture has been identified as a worthy model for singers. Back erect, body erect, balanced delicately on the two feet, shoulders back, sternum relatively high, held high head held high on the cervical spine, slightly elevated. Only the necessary tensions are allowed. All other tensions in the neck, the shoulders, the torso, the legs must be released. This is important because it matters, not just for the sake of appearance, but because body systems communicate with each other efficiently when energy channels are free from interference with each other. Johan gave us a great presentation on the breath. I would only say that I agree with him. Respiration is a natural thing that we humans do. To sing well, however, we must use what we do naturally and optimize that function to support the demands of powerful singing. You know, there's so many different ideas about breath for singing. There are down and outers and in and uppers and back breathers and proponents of the iron epigastrum. I believe if you follow the physiology of human respiration, you can't go too far off the mark. Of course, we must learn to generate subglottal pressures that far exceed that, that we need for normal life, but not, 
more than what we use for some of our primal vocal gestures like yelling and hollering. So for me, I go with Manuel, Manuel Garcia on this, as in so many other things, initiate with a diaphragmatic descent that produces an expansion of the abdominal wall. Two-thirds of the way to a full diaphragmatic breath, you firm the abdominal wall and complete the inhalatory gesture with an expansion of the thorax. Those are, that's the way he described breath. The support gesture includes contraction of perhaps both the abdominal wall and the thorax while maintaining that noble posture as just described. This regimen is especially important for singers in training. If nothing else, doing so removes one of the elements of variability that I mentioned earlier. If you don't offer them instruction on this point, they will just do what comes naturally, and for most of them, that is uh, not sufficient. In bel canto singing, we must learn to establish the unique timbre, often referred to as chiaroscuro, literally bright dark. This is one of the things that distinguishes this genre of singing from all the rest. It has long been appreciated that chiaroscuro is in large part created by lowering the larynx in the neck below its resting posture. The best opportunity to establish the correct posture of the larynx is, in my opinion, upon the inhalatory gesture. So as we take in air with the feeling of the beginning of a yawny stretch, the singer must be trained to maintain then that posture throughout the entire singing range. The elongated vocal tract that results from this has a richer timbre as all the resonances are lower in pitch than they would be otherwise. And last time I checked, the lowered larynx and the resulting changes in the shape of the pharynx was still credited as being the source of the singer's form. It is indisputable that the mainstream of bel canto singing is accomplished with the low larynx. As Luciano Pavarotti once said, it is in the position of rest. <laughs> and it removes the effort from singing. On the contrary, if the larynx is high, the, the mechanics are just all wrong. It is hindered in its ability to function properly and usually results in a significant loss of range in power. And it produces a permanent defraud in timbre a cartoonish voice. It is so interesting to me that I never hear a successful CCM singer with a habitually high larynx. And yet it is one of the most common faults that I find in bel canto singers. Just makes no sense to me whatsoever. In my own teaching hierarchy, this element takes its position at the keystone of the arch of important matters. Now there must be equal attention given to keeping the vowels bright. It's a balance. Vowel purity has been discussed as a primary goal since the earliest treatises that we have. Garcia said that it could take two years for a singer to acquire a proper ava. I give mine four. <laughs> the Italian language gives us the benefit of pure vowels, and so it is usually the language to which we spend a great deal of attention. When you focus on the open throat, finding the ability to balance the dark, rich resonance with the bright vowels is a noble effort and must be accomplished. Few matters are as controversial among academic voice teachers, especially as the matter of how to begin the tone. I won't review the long history of disagreement, of disagreement on this, but suffice it to say that our profession largely remains under the influence of old Bernoulli. William Bernard is probably most responsible for the almost ubiquitous opinion that phonation must begin with airflow first, and that the negative pressures created between the vocal folds will initiate the optimal phonatory oscillation. And this is what I was taught. And this is what I passed on to my students for years until I read Jim Stark's book, A History of Bel Canto, many years ago now. <clears throat> for the first time, I was confronted with the other side of the position that says that optimal phonation is executed when the glottis is closed first, and that tone is initiated by the crisp, sudden release of pressure from beneath the vocal folds. This is Garcia's coup de la glotte. It is not the same as the harsh glottal onset, as is commonly believed. I teach a clean, precise tone as Garcia described. Come si parla applies once again. We do not speak with aspirates. Oh, that was awesome. <laughs> we say, oh, that was awesome. Nice, clean, precise onsets. Dr. Courtney Austin has proposed a new classification system using numerical values rather than terms. She has shown that there is an acoustic benefit of type 3, true coup de la glotte, over type 2, the well-coordinated onset, and of course type 4, the harsh heart glottal attack. 
She'll be presenting more information on this matter on Thursday evening. The vocal folds vibrate in several different forms or modes. We've heard discussion of this today already. For most singing, we can limit our discussions for singing in the bel canto genre to mode one and mode two. Mode one is characterized by contraction of the vocalis muscle, which produces a notable change in the shape of the vocal folds as seen on the right-hand side of this drawing from Ingo Thies' book. Folds that are deep and square oscillate with less driving pressure, have higher close quotients, and create high levels of energy in the upper partials. It is historically referred to as chest voice or modal voice. Mode two is characterized by less depth of, con of contact, less contraction of the vocalis muscle, and lower close quotients, and is used primarily by treble singers to produce what we usually refer to as the head voice. Registers have been used to develop and build the voice long before we had any knowledge of these things. Targeted exercises that focus on mode one can permanently enhance the shape of the vocal fold, creating a more efficient oscillator. To build a robust or powerful voice, exercising mode one register is indispensable. While lower voices sing almost exclusively in mode one, developing their mode two can be very beneficial in preventing hyperfunction and muscularity in the higher range of the voice. Register breaking or yodeling between the two modes has been used for centuries to prevent heaviness and assure that the lower voices gain access to the upper end of their pitch range with freedom. Sculpting the vocal folds through mode one work has a huge impact on the quality of mode two in treble voices. The tone is more complex and more flexible because the work in mode one has rounded the underbelly of the folds permanently, even when they are elongated and functioning in mode two. All great operatic sopranos have had powerful chest voices, whether they use it or not artistically. There has long been an unsupportable bias against training mode one, especially in academic voice training. All you must do to be convinced of the fallacy of this position is to listen to the great operatic sopranos of any era. They all use the chest voice even if they believe that they do not. <laughs> if you're interested in these ideas, I'm offering a workshop on Saturday devoted to the use of the two primary registers. Friday. Um, Friday, sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, in the development of the dynamic voice. And I believe that this kind of work applies to all genres. Of course, there are acoustic events that have been identified as register shifts. Ken Bozeman has been very helpful in helping us understand these events. And this graph is from his book. When a partial passes through a foreman ascending, there is an audible closing of the tandem when ascending and an opening when descending. This is an important matter for all voices, but must be understood, especially in lower voices. There is an expected change of timbre as a lower voice ascends in their range that occurs somewhere around E4, give or take a pitch or more. As the pitch ascends, the second harmonic passes through the first formant and there is a highly valued change of timbre where they go into their head voice. This is a non-negotiable for anyone expecting to sing at an elite level. Teachers must know how to teach it and singers must learn how to do it. All do not. I'm forever dismayed at the number of incoming graduate students that I see over the years who do not know how to do this. And if the throat is open, the larynx remains relatively low, and as they ascend into this part of the range, it will happen quite naturally. That's easy to say, not easy to do. <laughs> Foundational exercises provide the structure for a, method for a, a methodical and progressive regimen of voice development. These are built upon several key articulations that are a part of the historical record of voice training. In the study of almost any instrument, the sustained tone is the first step in putting it all together. Much is to be gained from doing so, building strength in the entire body, establishing security of intonation as stability of support is understood, matters of proper resonance, etc. It is simple enough to allow a singer and teacher to monitor posture and any excessive tensions in the face of the body. In the historical record, this is always exercise number one. This is the primary tool in building strength and bulk in the TA, given the correct range, as I just discussed. This exercise is taken from a method book by uh, Santi Damaro from the early 1840s. I might add, she was a coloratura soprano. She taught coloratura sopranos. Notice the beginning pitch, B flat, 
three, I think, or yeah, B flat three. What register do you, what mode do you think that's supposed to be? Wow. You're dang right, it's supposed to be chess one. <laughs> Ornamental. Literally to carry. Once the sustained tone is established, the singer must learn how to carry the voice from one place to the next. The tone must be continuous between the pitches, no articulations in between. I have to encourage my students to sing sloppy, that's the way I put it, because they are so resistant to doing so with their years of uh, choral training. It's very difficult for them to learn how to do this. The goal is to maintain equal strength and with no change of timbre from one pitch to the next, small intervals to larger ones. Legato is the ultimate goal. Smooth singing uh, separates the wheat from the shaft. The staccato, neatly articulated tones of short duration. Garcia described the staccato as a global articulation supported by a constant breath. Each tone is a little coup de la blot. This is a core exercise for every voice. All the intrinsic laryngeal muscles are involved and it produces and trains a very efficient and strong larynx. One of the other important articulations included, uh, well, they include things like aspirato, marcato, and repeated tones. Knowing how to properly articulate these repeated tones that you see here in uh, Donna Anna's aria, No Me Dear, is really important. You see the repeated uh, B flats, the repeated tones are marked with an X, and uh, if a singer doesn't know that they are supposed to release the first B flat and then re articulate the second B flat, this is impossible to sing. Mm -hmm. The contemporary methods don't talk about this. Uh, I, I found this in the historical uh, uh, record, uh, but we have to know how we have to know how to do these things. And of course, the great artists who sing this. I wish I had time to play Adita sing this for us, but I don't have time. Practice. Oh, I'm gonna have to stop. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> Nothing happens without practice. It is just expected that a music of, uh, that a musician of any kind must do the time in the practice room. We've learned a lot about how to practice from the skill acquisition literature. We now know that, that disappearing into the practice room for two or three hours at a time is not only risky, but it also doesn't give our brain the best shot at learning. Shorter sessions with lots of breaks and adding a certain random quality to the session all can enhance the learning process. Lots more could be said on this and have, I've learned a lot of this here at this meeting. And of course, we must teach our students to how to keep their voices healthy. The greatest risk to a student singer is too much singing. We have institutionalized overuse by placing so many demands on their singing voice that are required of them by virtue of them being a music maker. Yes. So we must help our students understand that there is a limit to how much singing they should do in a day and help them realize that they can stay out of trouble from overuse with planned rests of or silence during the day. We also need to teach them how to say no and support them when challenged by our colleagues who would use them till they drop. We also need to consider the master schedule for the year and make sure that we don't allow everything to happen within the same two or three week period at the end of the semester. Yeah. So I've heard it said that a great singing teacher must first and foremost be a great diagnostician so that you can evaluate the faults and then prescribe a cure. A slightly different approach is to treat the voice holistically and make sure that all the prerequisite skills for great singing are in place and nothing has been overlooked or skipped. This means that your lesson with a young professional or a DMA student may be very much like your entering freshman lessons. All great golfers have periods of time when they go back and work through the basics to keep their game at the highest level. And I believe singers are no different. And I thank you for your time.